All right, God bless your hearts. This is Pastor Smith, First Gospel Church, Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, this live broadcast is uh, tonight at 7 p.m. Thursday, June the 10th, 2021. And uh, I'll give a few minutes here for uh, folks to get on. Um, Uh, I would like to mention that um, I want everyone, if they would, to continue to pray for Brother Majesty in Naples, Florida, pastor there, Gospel Assembly Church, works under Brother Yvonne Georges. He's been unconscious now for, oh, I guess going on the second month. Um, he had a major heart attack and um, it left him totally unconscious. He never gained conscious again. Uh, so we, I told him we'd certainly keep praying for him. Um, also, Brother, Brother um, ZZ in Miami, Florida, has been in the hospital. He did get out of the hospital today. He has a heart condition that caused him to have very low blood pressure. And uh, anyway, they got him, I think, fixed on his medications and all. They sent him home, but I want to keep praying that he'll have a full recovery. Then I certainly want to mention Sister Julie Crafton in our church here in Little Rock. I had a stroke a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she's undergoing therapy, but she's still, you know, having trouble on her left side with her left motive, motive um, uh, motor skills in her, her leg. She's walking some of the walkers, still having trouble with her left arm. Her, maybe her speech, I don't know if it's still slurred a little bit, but anyway, she still certainly needs our prayers. So please keep her in your prayer list. I'm starting off here with a, a uh, prayer request, but we need it. And then um, um, Brother Bill Daniels certainly still needs our prayers. He's just having such a bout with uh, congestive heart failure. And uh, he just, he can't hardly keep the water off of his heart. And he's just an up and down everyday ordeal. And it really has worn on him for the last few months. Please keep praying for him. Um, Brother Ray Weaver, uh, he had uh, renal cancer, which is kidney cancer, and he's undergoing um, chemotherapy treatments, and uh, we're still working on his house. We finally got the electrical done, but we're still trying to get it ready for him to move back in. And... Um, so keep him and his wife, Sister Susan, in prayer. Um, I don't know um, who else might be mentioned here tonight. Sister Cindy Smith, my grand, my daughter-in-law, she, her mother, Sister Angie Elder certainly needs our prayers. She's her heart. Uh, condition and uh, she is right now staying with Michael and Cindy and so I know she would appreciate it we keep her on our prayer list all right I want to welcome everyone um, I might just mention to you uh, mention it here recently concerning the writings of the New Testament I think it's interesting and important to understand that um, that the New Testament writings that we have is by far mostly written to the Gentiles. And I think you ought to consider there's a reason for that. Um, we have very little knowledge or insight into what really took place overall 
in the New Testament church under the 12 apostles that were the apostles to the Jews. Paul, of course, being the apostle to the Gentiles. I think it's very interesting that um, almost the whole New Testament is written to Gentiles. And no doubt that's because uh, they, those back there in the New Testament church, they had those apostles in person, you know, live. And uh, they heard them and uh, saw the manifestation of God through them. And uh, so I know we do have, you know, we have the writings of Peter. However, both epistles that Peter wrote were to the Gentile churches while Paul was in prison. And uh, uh, I've shown that, and I I'm certainly could show it again, how that the, both letters themselves reveal that he's writing to the Gentiles. In fact, the first letter, I believe it is, shows that it was Silas that wrote the letter for Paul, for Peter. Uh, but but let's, if you take the 12 apostles, um, Peter's brother, Andrew, we don't know very, very much at all about the apostle Andrew and his works among the Jews. And then James, uh, that apostle, apostle James, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, James and John, that James was martyred. He was the first apostle to be martyred. So we don't know very much about him. Um, his brother John, of course, wrote the Gospel of John before the day of Pentecost, before the New Covenant came into effect. And then he wrote the three apostles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But those letters were written in the very end of the Jewish world, and they were primarily written to Gentile churches. Um, and so then Philip, the apostle Philip, it's not very much, we don't know much about him. Um, Matthew, we've got the gospel, but we don't have any of his works or what he actually did. We do have, you know, an understanding of the New Testament, the first, oh, what, eight chapters of Acts, but then once the apostle Paul was converted, everything was about Paul and his work among the Gentiles. And then, um, let's see, I'm trying to get these apostles by memory, uh, Bartholomew. What do you know about Bartholomew and what he did and, and his, his acts and the works of that apostle? And then Thomas. Uh, then, uh, uh, what is this? Uh, Simon the Zealot. We don't know anything about him. Or James of Alphaeus. Uh, James wrote um, the Lord's half brother. He wrote the book of James, and it was written to the twelve tribes of Israel. So we have a little bit of knowledge of what John, J James was telling them, um, and that's probably the most uh, in depth. Uh, writing that we have concerning one of the apostles. Um, and then um, Thaddeus or Jude. Uh, we have the little book of Jude, one chapter. And um, then Matthias who took Judas Iscariot's place, we don't know anything about. So I'm just mentioning this to show you that the New Testament it was compiled primarily of writings to the Gentiles. And I certainly believe that that's because um, what the apostle Paul did, and it's very important for us Gentiles to understand. Um, and then, of course, John's letter um, in the book of Revelations is all about the future of the Gentile world and the harvest and the end of the Gentile world. So 
that's a, uh, I just thought I would mention that, that, you know, a lot of times we don't stop to think of some of these things and why they are like they are. Um, I will, I have, I've got this question concerning uh, the three woes in the book of Revelation. I might, might just mention those tonight. Um, um, and I might just say to you, you know, I'm, for some reason, I'm extremely tired this evening, so I may not, you know, sound real perky, but I'm, but I love the word of God and I just about love talking about it at any time. But um, it's just been one of those days. Um, anyway, concerning the, the, uh, the three woes, um, in Revelation, the, um, ninth chapter, and I'll mention this to you, um, I probably should go through this sometime a little slower, uh, it's in the 12th verse where it says, one woe is past. This is Revelation 9, 12. It says, one woe is pa past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Okay. Um, so uh, before that, in other words, what made him state that one was past was what he just had described in the fifth angel sounding. This is the fifth trumpet in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations. And I'll just tell you, you know, without going through it, uh, would take some time, but this is when the, when Mohammedism was introduced into the world by Muhammad. Muhammad, of course, he, he got his interest in the things of God through the New Testament uh, uh, and from the uh, Catholic Church. Uh, but the, and then he, you know, he really began to get interested in, in uh, religion. And of course, he came up with the, the doctrine of of Mohammedism. And after uh, he developed that, there was the crusades of the of Mohammed uh, and Muslims against the Catholic Church. And that, what that did was, is it, it caused the Catholic Church to get their focus on these crusades and wars and fightings against Mohammed. Uh, the Muslim movement and uh, I mean there were literal wars and um, so um, that that took their focus off of things that they had normally had in focus and and that caused that was a woe that caused uh, it allowed, let me say it that way, it allowed the, the Reformation to begin because God had them uh, sidetracked with the, with the Muslim crusades and the wars against Mohammedism. And that allowed uh, the Reformation to begin. There were men before, I'm sure most of you know about the 95 Theses that Martin Luther posted on the cathedral door in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, 95 uh, points that he felt like the Catholic Church had missed it, that God had revealed to him. But there were other reformers prior to him, like Tyndale and Huss, and men that God raised up right out of the Catholic Church. It took me time to understand that God uh, was in the Catholic Church. In fact, that's the only thing he had to work with. The Catholic Church ruled, it was a dragon power that ruled the world for 1260 years. 
and it ruled religion and, and it martyred, I think there were 50 million martyrs uh, of the Catholic Church because anyone that disagreed with their doctrine uh, was considered a heretic and they were many burned at the stake. And so uh, this was a woe that took place that actually set the Catholic Church back and allowed the Reformation to, to take place. And Martin Luther uh, uh, he, uh, he was the first man uh, first reformer that was able to sustain and not be martyred. The Catholic Church did have a death warrant out on him, but God protected him, and he was able to uh, minister his message, which his main message was uh, uh, the just shall live by faith, that it wasn't a ritual. It wasn't uh, the Catholic rituals that would save someone, but it was their faith. We, our father uh, is Abraham, faithful Abraham that was justified by his faith in God and God made a covenant with him and we're part of that covenant. So that was the first woe in, uh, in the book of Revelations. I, I could read that um, let me go on and talk because I may not have time, but I could come back and read it if, if um, we have time. Uh, but anyway, that was the first woe. If you read about it, it, it talks about, it's talking about um, um, the key. That is, there was a fifth angel, nine uh, verse 1, a fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit now that that is Catholicism right there the bottomless pit that is a religious system that has no foundation to it it's bottomless, no without a foundation, it's just you know, when that Jesus had said that that uh, he that builds his house on the sand, it surely would fall. Uh, but it, we have to build on a rock. And uh, this, this bottomless pit was false religion that didn't have a true foundation under it. And it said, and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the bottomless pit. And, and as the smoke of the great furnace and of the sun and the air were darkened by reason of smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locust unto the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions have power in the earth. See, okay, when when the bottomless pit was opened up, that there was a, there was a lot of uh, smoke or dissension or confusion, and out of that. Uh, the air was darkened. In other words, it's darkness. No one had any great understanding. And there came out of the, uh, out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass, neither any green tree, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. See, they could hurt those not God's children that had the seal of God in their foreheads, but uh, verse five said unto them, it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. That five months is, is prophetical months. Five 30 day months is 150 days or 150 years. And that's, uh, that, that's about how long that, that, uh, these, uh, the movement of Mohammedism uh, took place against the Catholic Church and that, that those wars, uh, those crusades took place. And so that was developed. He, you know, Muhammad, he got that. He got his beginning. He believed that Jesus was a prophet, but he, he did not. He reneged on the fact that he was the son of God but that he was a, just a prophet. 
anyway, Muhammadism was developed through through Muhammad, and uh, th that's this was the first war that took place, or, or first woe, excuse me, it's the first woe that uh, caused the Catholic Church to get their focus uh, on that and allowed the Reformation to take place. And then uh, the, the next woe that takes place, uh, it's in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations. Let's go there. Um, Revelations 11. And um, Okay, uh, let's start in in the eleventh verse, and I know that I'm, I'm you know I'm I'm not going through explaining where you're just going to have to more or less take my word for what I'm explaining, but I just basically want you to know what the three woes are. Number one was Mohammedism that came against the Catholic Church that allowed the Reformation to really get in uh, uh, get it begin to work and get, finally get established. Uh, here in the book of Revelations, it starts out showing the falling away of the church uh, and how the Gentiles trod it underfoot for 1260 years. And, uh, and so it was gonna take a building, uh, it's gonna take a reformation to reform the church. And uh, so the spirit of, uh, the, the, the Old and New Testament, which is these two uh, witnesses that's talked about here in the 11th chapter, it says that they lay dead in the streets for uh, three days and a half or three and a half years. It's the same prophetical timetable as the 1260 years that the word of God was in a, um, a condition where it, there was no one that had enough of the word of God that, that had an anointing that could uh, bring life, the anointing of God's spirit. And uh, here in the 11th verse, it said, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, that is the Old and New Testament, the two witnesses, and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell upon them that saw them. Now, this is talking about the Reformation. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Um, this, this doesn't take place. When you read it, it sounds like it happens just like that. But this is talking about the Reformation that started and finally got established uh, through Martin Luther and, uh, and the other reformers, uh, we're still in, we are still in the Reformation. And we're still waiting for God. We're hearing God say, come up hither, but we're not, we haven't been able to arrive in a second heaven condition where it says they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That cloud is a restored church. So it does show that there's going to be a restored church. Uh, Jesus is coming back in clouds. Y'all have heard me talk about that, how that Jesus is not coming back in literal clouds on a cloudy day. But that, that wording, that word cloud is symbolic of a restored church. It's, it's in a heavenly place much higher than the earthly uh, sensual, devilish realm. Uh, we're going to have to get up above where we're at uh, in, in earthly conditions and in a spiritual condition to be in a spiritual uh, cloud like heaven with God. If you remember Jesus in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, John saw one like unto the Son of Man sitting on a cloud with a with a sickle in his hand <clears throat> and a golden crown. And a voice came out of heaven and said, thrust in your sickle. 
for the earth is ripe and ready to reap. He was Remember, he was sitting on a cloud. That's a restored church. That sickle in his hand was the word of God in his fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Those and they are going to reap the earth once the church is fully restored. And so that's the setting here. And if you look at verse 13, it said the same hour there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell and the earthquake was slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Then he says the second po woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Well, the, uh, the second woe is this great earthquake. The same hour, there was a great earthquake. Well, you, you know, you have, to, you have to discern what is this earthquake? What's going to take place? Well, if we go back to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, we'll see an earthquake there that um, took place. And actually, it's uh, in my opinion, it's the same earthquake that's referred to down here. It is the second woe. And uh, let, me, let me read it to you here in, in Revelation 6, uh, verse 12. It says, I behold, I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black and a, as sackcloth and hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell from unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it, uh, when it is rolled together in every mountain, an island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and rich men and chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. Okay, this earthquake, uh, I say that this earthquake is the, it is the fall um, of America. Just like uh, AD 70, was, in AD 70, God, God judged and destroyed Jerusalem and uh, uh, that was a great shaking back there in the uh, in the Jewish world. Uh, but let's look here at why when this when this took place when this shaking took place, the uh, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became blood, and the star, stars of heaven fell to the earth. Uh, those are lights, the lights in heaven. Well, if you go back to, um, let's first go to Isaiah 13 and uh, verse 10. It says, uh, well, let's back up just a little bit because we need, to get a, we need to get a little bit of foundation of what he's talking about here. Um Let me look for you here just a second. Okay, Let, let's start in the ninth verse. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine, and I'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity and cause 
the arrogancy of the proud decease, and I'll lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I'll make a man um, more precious than fine gold, even a man that the golden we uh, that more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, and the wrath of the Lord's host in the day of His fierce anger. In the day of His fierce anger. Uh, this, I believe, is when God was, he, he turned the lights out. Um, let me go back to um, whoops, excuse me just a minute. So here, here, if you go back to the beginning of the of the thirteenth um, chapter of um, Isaiah, it starts off in the first verse saying, "The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see." So this it, this is a parable against Babylon. Um, that nation, when God judged Babylon, He turned their lights out. See, every dragon power is a light to the world of their day. If they're the superpower or leading nation in the world that basically rules the whole world, it, all the other nations look to them. There's another, if we look at how God judged Egypt the same way, look to Ezekiel 32.7. Um Well, let's back up to the second verse. It says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, and thou art as a whale in the seas. And thou camest forth with thy rivers, and troublest the waters with thy feet, and foulest their rivers. Thus saith the Lord God, I will therefore spread out my net over thee with a company of many people, and they shall bring thee up in my net. Then will I leave thee upon the land. I will cast thee forth upon the open field and will cause all the fowls of heaven to remain upon thee. And I'll fill the beast of the whole earth with thee. And I'll lay thy flesh upon the mountains and fill the valleys with thy height. I will also water with thy blood the land wherewith thou swimmest even to the mountains and the river shall be full of thee. And when I shall put thee out, here God is putting the nation of Egypt. He was judging them and putting them out as a dragon fire. Look how he said he would do it. I'll cover the heaven, make the stars there of dark. I'll cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord. I'll also vex the hearts of many people, which, so he's just showing here, he put Egypt, he, he, he put their lights out. They no longer was a light to the world. The same way here in Revelation 6, the United States of America, I am saying that the United States of America is this earthquake in Revelation 6, 12, where it says, he opened the sixth seal. See, we're in the sixth seal right now, saints. We are, uh, if you remember, the first seal was a white horse, then a red horse, then a black horse, then a pale horse. Then there was the souls under the altar. That's the brazen altar, by the way. And then now we're down in the end of the Gentile world here in the sixth seal. A lot of information, a lot more information in the sixth seal than there is in the first five seals because it has to do with the end of the Gentile world. And God will judge the United States of America. 
I had someone said recently said, I keep hearing say Brother Smith saying that God's gonna judge America, but I don't see I don't see too much scripture on that. Well, you gotta understand prophecy. Everything's not reveal, revealed by name and prophecy, but some of the uh, some of God's prophecy, if you see it, it's pretty obvious. Uh, look, the United States is the has been the greatest blessed nation in the Gentile world. The gospel. This is the place that gospel that God chose to restore His church, and it's not fully yet restored, but it we are in the end of the Gentile world. God will restore his church here in America, but he will judge America because this nation is has turned on God. I was thinking today, I was thinking about President Barack Obama when he said, while he was still president, that this United States of America is no longer a Christian nation. Um, do you think our forefathers ever had that intended in our uh, in our nation for it not to be a Christian nation? This nation that they uh, prayed in the Senate, they prayed in the Supreme Court, they put it on our you know on our money, the, our dollar bills. In God we trust. Uh, we're one nation under God. <coughs> No, our forefathers were Christian, God-fearing men that, and they're the ones that set this nation up to have separation of church and state. Well, this nation is because it is a superpower. There's no other nation like it in the world, and it will rise even greater, uh, and in and it will make up set up the mark of the beast, the image of the beast. Uh, and finally turn its power over to Catholicism again. This nation, God will judge it because this nation has turned away from God. They forgot God. They're not fearful of God. Our, na our, our government, they're promoting everything that is an abomination to God and against the word of God. They don't believe in the word of God anymore. God will judge America. Now, when I say that, I want you to know that I don't feel like that this earthquake is going to be a destroy America. It will bring America down as a superpower or a dragon power. This nation will no longer be a superpower. It will, I, I believe that most likely that our major military bases will, will be attacked I think there will be some war involved, but I don't think that it will destroy our nation. I think that it will uh, it will humble America as far as their civil powers, military powers, financial powers, and religious powers. I think God will take this nation down. It'll be much worse than when Russia, when Russia fell. It'll be much worse than that. And uh, America will never, never gain strength again uh, as a as a dragon power. But right now, America is the strongest nation in the world, even though they are. There's a lot of uh, dissension among our, our our government in America, but uh, and I don't think that when America becomes much greater, that causes them to have even greater power than they have right now. I don't think that's going to help the people of God that much. I, I think that if the, the the nation is going to rise for a short period of time and uh, it's going to do some wicked things, and you can see that happening right now if you've got spiritual eyes to see. Anyway, so uh, th so it's a shaking. God is going to, this will shake the world when America goes down. And that's why it is a earthquake. It's, it symbolizes that prophetically when God takes America down as a superpower and turns its lights out. The world won't look to America anymore after that happens. And, but people are going to recognize at that time that the day of God's wrath has come and 
as it says there in the last verse, who would be able to stand? Well, I'm saying in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, the body of Christ used to teach that there in the 11th chapter uh, of the book of Revelations, uh, that that earthquake used to teach that was World War I. And, but that, that wasn't a great enough shaking. It didn't have an effect uh, that would bring the second woe on the, in the earth. This, when this shaking takes place, it's gonna, it is going to shake. The whole world's gonna shake by it. And, um, and so uh, if we go back to the 11th chapter, uh, it says that they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. Okay, in the same hour as great earthquake. And the second woe is passed and the third woe cometh quickly. If you'll notice the next verse, it says the seventh angel sounded. Uh, this is the seventh trumpet. This is the last prophetical hour in the, uh, of the seventh, and the, se the seventh trumpet is the seventh last, uh, or the last prophetical hour. Uh, last 15 years in the Gentile world. And of course, that third woe is going to be the Battle of Armageddon, but it will, it will take time for that woe to take place. Uh, there will first be a harvest in that 15 year period. Then there will be the, finally, the seven woes will be poured out uh, that will finally bring eternal judgment on everything uh, in the end of the Gentile world ending in the battle of Armageddon. So uh, let me look here. To be honest with you, I didn't have this plan to talk on. I just, it just kind of come up in my mind when I started talking. Um, So there in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelations, um, verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they shall see his shame. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial upon the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. There was voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since man were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, so great, and the great city was divided into three parts. So <clears throat> uh, this last and third woe is the battle of Armageddon and the final judgment that's gonna come in the end of the Gentile world. And so I just thought I'd mention to you what those three woes are. And uh, you know, saints, we're, we're living uh, in a very serious time, uh, we still have a lot. There's still a lot to, to take place. These things right here are, are still several years off from taking place. But I think we ought to be considering with this pandemic, God did not spare the church from going through this pandemic with the rest of the world. And I believe that God, God really judgment first begins at the house of God. And I'm feeling like that we should be in a, in a greater search and dedication. It's like he said right here, I come as a thief. He said to watch and pray. Well, uh, I feel like that, uh, you know, Jesus, first Thessalonians five, Paul tells the church that Jesus is not coming back to the church as a thief but he's coming back to the world as a thief. They won't have any idea 
Jesus said that, that his coming would be like it was in the days of Noah. Men would be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. There's people right now that don't hardly have a clue as to what God is really doing. Uh, uh, you know, and there's people that's not, they're not, they're not trying to uh, watch. That is to watch God to get your eyes open to what God is doing and what he's going to do because he's talking to the church. Uh, Amos said, God doeth nothing, but yet first he shows it to his prophets. Well, God's gonna, God will show his church. In these last days, God will reveal to the church what he's doing. He did that in the early church and he will do it down there. In fact, he's doing it now to some extent but he'll do it far and a far greater extent when the church is fully fully restored. Uh, I had somebody ask me, well, what do we like, you know, having the church restored? Well, <laughs> uh, I guess I would have to say if we knew exactly what we was lacking, we wouldn't be lacking it. But one of the things we do know, we don't have the power and demonstration that the New Testament church had. We don't have an apostolic ministry with an apostolic order right now. We have a ministry. I do believe we have apostles to a certain level. I think the fivefold ministry we have, but I don't think they're functioning fully like they will function in the early church yet. I think we're just developing into that. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly feel like that with this pandemic, we ought to consider that God's not only talking to the world, but he's talking to us. This world, God's getting this world ready. The world is going to get back to normal here pretty soon. God shook it a little bit with this pandemic, but most people won't hearken to that. But I think that the people of God should. I think the people of God are to start trying to get closer to God and Gird, their, gird up their minds and their spirit towards the things of God and get closer to God. I've really been trying to promote here of late for our saints here in Little Rock to read their Bible through this year. And I've even told them to read it as much as you can like husbands and wives. Read it together. Discuss what you've read. You know, it doesn't it's not that hard to read the Bible through. It's only like three or four chapters a day if you read it every day. Well, my wife and I probably read, we normally read, on a normal basis, we try to read nine chapters a day, three days of Bible reading at one time because there's always something that comes up that prevents our reading. You know, we normally, we seldom read them on Saturdays and Sundays. And then if there's a day during the week that we miss reading, then that reading three times, and we are way ahead of track. Um, we'll probably finish our Bible reading before September, sometime in the middle of August this year, if we stay on the same track that we're on right now, which we have been on. Um, in fact, I didn't really get started reading with her from Genesis until February, so we missed the first month. But we we caught up way beyond that. We're, you know... Like I said, we'll be through in the middle of August if we stay on the same track we're on. So you can read it through a lot easier than you may think that you can. But when you read it alive with someone else, or if you have it like on a, on a recording audio, and you let, let that audio play and you both follow on, and then if you pause it, because if there's something you want to discuss together, you can pause it, talk about it, and then go back Go back to your reading. Just reading it alone will help you so much. It will quicken you to realize uh, the seriousness of, of serving God. And you'll have more awe. You'll have more respect. You'll have more fear of God. Uh, you know, when you look at the Bible and see how they missed it, how the Jews missed it so many times and how God always judged. He always brought judgment on them and he did it to bring them back to him. But 
So many were lost in all of their foolishness of not staying close to God. And so I think it's important that we stay close to God right now. Watch the Lord. I mentioned these prayers, these prayer requests at the beginning of the broadcast, but remember next week is the minister's meeting at the campground. Uh, you saints pray, all of you that can't go, that's not going, pray for your ministry. Uh, they, this ministry is who you do, you depend on God to reveal to this ministry, to reveal to you. Uh, and that's what the ministry is for. It's, it's for the perfecting of the saints. It's for the work of the ministry uh, so that someone could be dedicated to that because everyone can't be dedicated to it uh, in their everyday life. And so God gives a ministry for his people to help them. So pray for your ministry while they're uh, at this minister's meeting that God will give us some things that will take us a little uh, take us up a little higher, a little closer to him. All right, well, uh, I know this Bible study may not have been uh, real in-depth, but I, I just wanted to share with you a little bit uh, concerning what the three woes are. We can go into the scriptures to uh, prove why we're seeing what those three woes are, and we can talk about them a little bit more in the future, but Right now, if someone asks you, what are the three woes? You ought to be able to tell them the first woe is Mohammedism that came against the Catholic Church. Uh, that was a woe because it, it, it caused the Catholic Church to focus in a different direction, which allowed the Reformation to begin to work. And then the second woe, uh, that will be an earthquake which I believe that is definitely the fall of America from a super power or a dragon power. God will bring judgment on this nation. And of course, that's going to shake the whole world. And during that time, it, it, uh, during that, that time of all what's going to be taking place in all of the different world powers, uh, God will have a restored church that's going to begin to a work and the restoration is going to begin to harvest God's people out of this world and make up the remainder of his bride. Um, and of course, the final woe, third woe will be uh, judgment of, of the uh, upon the end of the Gentile world. After that, the battle of, I mean, the uh, the millennial reign will start. And so God will have made up his bride by before the end of, or before the battle of Barmageddon and the last woe, he will have harvested this world, made up the remainder of his bride that will rule with him and reign with him a thousand years um, during the millennial reign. I want to be a part of that. And I know you probably do too. All right, God bless your heart, saints. Remember, the prayer requests that I mentioned at the beginning of this broadcast, pray for me um, and I'll pray for you. Pray for this meeting that we're going to uh, this next week. We'll be in the meeting in uh, Shepherdsville, Kentucky at the campground. It's the first meeting since I've been in a body in 43 years that has been a minister's meeting. So just at that, it'll be an interesting meeting, but this brotherhood has not been together since the pandemic. Uh, and so we're looking forward to coming together once again. And I do thank God for the fact that there's such, you know, that COVID has really come down in the United States. However, there, it's still bad in many countries. Uh, Brother Fidel in Guatemala City, Guatemala, uh, COVID's still bad over there. It's still bad. They still have a curfew and the Dominican Republic, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people getting sick. Oh, by the way, one of the people that I didn't mention was Brother Mark Boyd's parents. His mother and father are both in the hospital in Springfield, Missouri, both positive with COVID-19. They really need your prayers. They, they were very sick when they went into the hospital. 
So pray for Brother Mark Boyd's parents. All right. God bless your hearts. I love you all. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. Good night.